on this computer. Okay, our webinar is live. I don't see any uh, people though. Oh, no. <laughs> really, I don't see where our guests are. Could they be in a different link? No, they on, should be. On Zoom, I see about 11 other people have showed up. Oh, really? I, I don't see that. It'll be oh, under yeah, I see 16 people. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi. All right, I don't see them. So, okay, well, let's start. Let's start. There's, okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, guests and panelists, to our virtual conversation series. My name is Joel Buno, and I am the executive director here at the Asia Institute Crane House located in beautiful old Louisville. We do miss gathering together and I'm certain we will be gathering together again soon. We are fortunate though that technology has progressed and has, has allowed us to continue to gather virtually to share great art, culture and experiences from Asia and the Pacific Islands. Asia Institute Crane House is a 501c3 nonprofit and depends on the generosity of supporters like you to help us continue to offer great programming. Please consider a tax deductible gift to Asia Institute Crane House to support our work. I will post a direct link for contributions in the chat box. We have a great panel and a great topic this evening. Food connects people with culture and is a means of connecting heritage and history. The, Ameri the American melting pot adds another layer in addition to that of a specific cuisine's original origin. Leading us in this evening's discussion is our board vice chair, Dimitri D. Antimisaris. D, who's one of my uh, friends as well, is the director of the University of Louisville's Fraser Polypharmacy and Medication Management Program, a program dedicated to education research and outreach regarding polypharmacy. Dee is a board member of Asia Institute Crane House and has an interest in traditional Asian medicine, especially the intentional aim of Asian cuisine for health. So without further delay, it is my honor to introduce our facilitator, Dee Antimisaris. Dee. Thank you, Joel. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining our conversation. I'm looking forward to um, talking with you. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, please add them to the chat or the, or the Q&A and we will try to get to them as we're, as we're having this conversation. Um, so it, it is my pleasure to present our conversation for tonight called Unearthing Your Roots, Connecting with Culture Through Food. Today we have two honored guests, Adrian Lewis Chan, cook and food writer is joining us from the San Francisco Bay Area and hosts workshops exploring Asian American heritage cooking and folk traditions. Adrian's workshops center around food to help participants explore a variety of traditions and cultures, which helps participants explore their own culture. Also joining us is Bob Jones from right here in Louisville. He is a longtime member and supporter of Asia Institute Crane House. Bob is the Crane House resident expert on Chinese history and archaeology. He's an archaeologist who focuses on ancient China and does talks about the archaeology of old and new Chinese cuisines, amongst other topics, including the Silk Road. I'd like to invite Adrian and Bob to share insights about their work and expertise, and then we will discuss the relationship between food, oral traditions, history, and the modern world. So I'd like to start by welcoming Adrian. Adrian, can you tell us about yourself and Asian American heritage cooking and folk traditions? I sure can. And um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I see I've got some friends and students here that have joined. So I'm sure some of you will be a bit sick of hearing me talk about this more. But um, again, thank you so much for, for having me, Dee. Thank you so much. And thank you, Crane House, uh, for, in, uh, for inviting me to share space with all of you. Um, again, my name is Adrian Chang, Adrian Lewis Chang. 
I reside on Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo land, currently known as West Sonoma County in California, Northern California, that is. Uh, I'm a cook, food writer, cooking teacher, and my work is focused on the exploration and celebration of the Asian American experience through food. A uh, little personal story, my grandma Jean was actually the older sister of Helen, the founder of Crane House, so I am so, so honored to be here and to be part of this conversation and part of our family legacy. It really means a lot to me, so thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge first that um, following the events in Atlanta and indeed the anti-Asian attacks across the globe, it's all the more important that we find that we AAPI folks find ways of coping to find comfort and to find ways of holding safe spaces for ourselves in which we can feel loved. And I think that this topic can be so important during these times when we really just need to feel like we're around the comfort of, fam of family. So thank you guys for creating this space for us and our community. I often describe um, what I do as identity cooking, um, namely heritage cooking as a way of exploring one's cultural ident identity for the purposes of connecting with heritage, family, ancestors, and understanding one's place in the world as an AAPI person. Uh, this is not limited to cooking only the food of one's blood lineage. It can also include um, exploration of the cuisines of other Asian American of, of other Asian American cuisines and the Asian American community as a whole, the incorporation of cuisines from other cultures which have influenced one's life as an Asian American. And essentially it's really expressing one's true authentic self through the creative and meditative process of cooking. So one might think that eh, that's just food. How can I, how can that have any major revelatory effect on understanding who I am or where I belong in the world? And you know, that to a degree that's true, food is food, it's sustenance, it's what we need to eat to survive, but you know, food is also who we are, right? It's about history, it's where we come from, it's where we've been, it's our stories, the stories of our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, immigrant, American-born, it's the way we express our culture, our beliefs, and our, way of, our ways of living through a means of nourishment, but a kind of nourishment far more important far more than just satiating our appetites or eating to survive. So when you think about food and the power it has to bring people together, the power it has to cultivate togetherness in a family or a community, the power it has to evoke strong memories of emotions, be it your mother's mapo tofu or your grandfather's recipe for a masala chai, or even comfort foods like instant noodles, like shin ramyun or something as seemingly insignificant as a box of vita soy, you know, these cultural foods have the power to make us feel deep emotional connections to things that have impacted us, things which we've experienced in the past in regards to our heritage and things that are very, very precious to us. So therefore, it also goes to say that we should be able to also harness this power of food to create new connections with part of ourselves, which perhaps we may never have explored before or even unearthed before. So a little bit about me and how I came to this. Um, growing up Chinese American in the 80s was really, really hard. Uh, even being from you know, liberal and diverse, the liberal and diverse Bay Area where we apparently have the largest population of Chinese outside of China. I'm not sure if that's true, but that's what I've heard. To be honest, I grew up really struggling to accept my Asian-ness as a kid, despite the large Asian population out here. There were in fact times that I hated it. I hated myself for being Chinese. You know, I was a foreigner to my peers in school. I looked different. I was constantly reminded of that. You know, I had friends doing that stupid Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees thing in the playground, I'm shaking, just thinking about it. And I grew up, you know, actively rejecting the Chinese and Asian American side of myself. On the flip side, the food at home was different. I never considered that the Chinese and Asian food that my mom cooked at home to be anything foreign or strange. And Maybe that's because I was born into it, like literally foon sped one ton yen as a baby. <laughs> so maybe this was something I never really thought twice about or, you know, something I never thought could be significant. And throughout all the years of fighting my Asian-ness and striving to, striving to be as American as possible or whatever the heck that means, the food and my love for Asian food was always there for me. And I've always loved to cook. So in a way I was lucky that I was able to maintain that connection, even if I didn't realize it was there at the time. My mom always said that when I was a young kid, I would wake up in the morning, like really early, grab a stool, bring it to the stove and cook chow fan for myself. <laughs> Not quite sure if that's true, but you know how, mom, how moms are, they like to exaggerate. Um, and that kind of went on for a while, but after college, I ended up moving to Japan on a whim. And I ended up staying there and lived there 
and around Asia for over a decade. So Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, and Sri Lanka. And it was during this time that I was really able to delve deeply into the connectivity between Asian cultures and especially through the diverse food cultures and food traditions there. And I really cultivated an appreciation for Asian cultures, especially my own Chinese culture when I lived in Singapore. And when I was there, I felt like a proper Asian. <laughs> you know, I really felt like a proper Asian when I was there. No one looked at me twice. I was welcomed with open arms. I could fade into a crowd people, and people got me and they liked me. But when my husband and I moved back to the United States a few years ago, I strangely found myself drifting towards old habits, feeling called to fit in again, because when I'm in the United States, people see the color of my skin first. They see my eyes first. And then when we moved to Sonoma County, because you know I've always loved the romance of Americana culture, like ranches and cows, horses, good looking cowboys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I found myself surrounded, uh, surrounded by nothing but white people. And white people, I'm sorry, I love you, but I need more diversity in my life. So my point is, I was really missing Asian community. I was desperate for it. And then things happened. I went through this period of depression for about a, um, for about a year and a half when there was this tumultuous family event which happened and caused my family a lot of turmoil. And I was in this place where I didn't feel like I was around people who understood me or saw me. And then my grandmother on my dad's side passed away. And that was really the final straw that broke the camel's back. And I found myself in that moment, desperately scrambling to find ways to still feel close to her. And I found myself subconsciously craving all of my favorite dishes of hers that she used to cook. So, you know, we've got what we call in my family beef and uns, which is basically cornstarch tenderized beef, stir fried with onions and soy sauce and what I call grandma's tofu, which is silken tofu with oyster sauce and sesame oil and green onions. And of course her, her one ton, which we'd make by hand as a family. And that was my family's favorite of hers, really. Um, I found myself really in that moment being cradled by these dishes when I cooked and ate them. And I found myself feeling closer to her and also found my depression start to leave me. And I spent a year, about a year, really obsessed, obsessed with cooking her recipes and searching through her books. And after about six months or so into it, my depression, I noticed it was gone. And in a cheesy way, I kind of look back at it and think that it was as if she helped me through it. So I decided to start an Instagram account sharing real Asian American food with my white Sonoma County community and also sharing my struggle with depression and how food and its connection to my grandmother and my heritage and my family brought me out of it. And so now everything's kind of blown up and over the last three years and I've gone even further than that. So in this quest to share Asian food through the lens of an actual Asian American, I've uncovered and learned so much about my own Chinese heritage and specifically Chinese culinary traditions that I wasn't even aware of before. So now I'm finding myself doing things like fermenting my own soybeans and making my own tofu from scratch and incorporating traditional Chinese medicinal herbs and theory into my food, growing my own Asian vegetables at home like gai choy, mustard greens or ku gua, bitter melon, excuse me. And all of these things have kind of, you know, become a meditation for me in incorporating the Chinese and the Asian side of myself into my daily life. And it's also contributed to cultivating a healthier lifestyle, physically and mentally. And what I've been learning and sharing over the last three years has really helped me cultivate a deep sense of pride for both my Chinese heritage and greater Ameri uh, Asian American community, um, something that I've never really felt before. Um, and I can't describe it, but it's, it's it's incredibly freeing and extremely liberating to not have only to have to have to only to not only have unlocked this side of me, but to also share it proudly and unapologetically. And so, what's mostly important, and what's actually come out of this, and this is is this creation of a community which I ended up gathering around me, one that, like I said, I've never really had before. And you know, this is part of a movement which you know, not started by me by any means, but one I'm proud to be a part of, the coming together of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders from all corners of our community, proudly sharing our stories and connections to each other through reminiscing and talking about the food we all grew up with and the food of our collective heritages. And it's very, very comforting, but also so powerful to have that aha or like you too moment with people where you connect over something so seemingly familiar, uh, familiar and personal. So for example, I can't tell you how many people when I were chatting on Instagram or in our platforms, how many people jump at the conversation of what's in your joke or what's in your rice porridge. You know, people love talking about things like this 
because it reminds them of family and it reminds them of community and gives them this feeling of belonging when so many of us have struggled with the feeling like we don't belong. Um, and the most, so the most significant part of all of this for me is this feeling of family that has been created. So now as um, Dee mentioned, I'm teaching, uh, co-teaching a virtual workshop series called Asian American Folk Traditions, which explores Asian traditions, which are centered around food, food as uh, medicine, wellness, sustainable living, and around AAPI community. Uh, my co-teacher, Erin Wilkins, is a Yonsei fourth generation Japanese American traditional Chinese medicinal practitioner <laughs> and acupuncturist. She's also the owner of Herb Folk Medicine in Petaluma here in Sonoma County. She's where I get all my herbs from now. And with her knowledge, we apply traditional Chinese and Western theory, the practices and the herbs to um, Asian and Asian inspired recipes created by me and then centered again around daily living, health and wellness. And we teach them in lectures, discussions, cook alongs and place them in the context, as I said, of Asian and Asian American traditions being shared by Asian Americans for our community, but then also sharing our stories with non-Asians, but through our lens. And there's even time for these group discussions where our students can share their own personal experiences, their family histories, their stories, et cetera. And it's a real community-based series. And again, I can't tell you how empowering it is to be on a Zoom meeting with like 25 to 50 people. And we've even had 200 people before, um, you know, from all across the country and even overseas, all of us practicing qigong together or cooking together or talking about all things Asian and Asian American, but centered around food together, you know, the celebration of our heritage and our community. And so many of our students have now told us how empowered they feel and how much more connected they feel to their heritage and to the Asian American community. And that's exactly what we set out to do. And it's so great because in addition to that, our non-Asian friends are also there, open arms, and ready to just listen and learn, hear what we have to say about our own heritage, like actually hear us out. So it's really a super positive environment to be in. It just feels like family. And um, so long story, long story short, too late, sorry. Uh, this is the kind of work um, that I've been doing, the kind of work that I've been uh, dedicating my cooking to recently, which is really recreating spaces in which you know, I and my community can heal and explore ourselves, our cultural identities through food. And, and so I can help others do the same. And it's really been an amazing journey so far. And I'm, I'm just super grateful, grateful to be surrounded by, by family, so. Adrian, that's fantastic. I really appreciate your um, sharing those insights. And, um, you know, I think that what you're doing is something very um, needed. Uh, and, I, and I think that people don't even realize it. So uh, my story is somewhat similar. Um, your auntie, Helen, was of the same generation. Actually, her best friend growing up is one of my aunties. It's really weird. And um, I grew up in the 60s where there were no uh, recent immigrant Chinese communities. It was just um, the first wave of Chinese immigrants, the Cantonese in the late 1800s. And then they just really worked hard to assimilate. And so really the cuisine changed. The uh, American Chinese cuisine well, almost uh, was unrecognizable from the original. And uh, it's, it is interesting what you're saying. I remember the only way we could get Chinese food was either at grandma's house or at home or in Chinatown. And, and that was it. And um, when I got older, I came to realize that um, food is so multidimensional and means so many things to so many people. You know, there's food as, as uh, in the Chinese culture, literally as a medicine, right, as health. Um, there's eating very the freshest ingredients you can. There were a lot of cultural things that I took for granted because I was so busy trying to fit in in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> and I only wish that that generation were alive still. And I'm grateful to you for bringing that to the younger people and, and to the modern day. I think it's wonderful. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, hmm. we'll talk a little more about uh, you know all this, how all this connects together. And I would like to ask Bob to to come on and and talk to us because he has yet another perspective about uh, food. Uh, he knows a lot about really old Chinese food um, and the history of Chinese food. Bob, would you like to share yeah. with us a little bit to join our conversation? Sure, I'd be happy to. And Adrian, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I know how much food is 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 part of family and family is, is part of, you know, just living. Um, okay, so I also wanted to thank um, Dee and Joel for putting us together um, and uh, for helping out with uh, the technology uh, aspect of this. 
Um, and I, tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about the two great loves of my life and that's Chinese food and Chinese archeology span is to, uh, <clears throat> to quote Dee, it's, uh, it's a love of really, really old food. Uh, <clears throat> and my interest in both Chinese food and archeology span goes way back to university when as an undergraduate, I began to study the, the Chinese language. Um, <clears throat> and I lived in Taiwan for almost 10 years. I studied, uh, when I was in Taiwan, I studied the archeology span of ancient China. And um, <clears throat> on a research field trip, I spent three months traveling throughout China, uh, not only sampling the history, but also <clears throat> the cuisine of every region that I was in. And I just fell in love with lots and lots of the, the, the food. Um, <clears throat> now, it was reported a few years ago, the discovery in China of what, <clears throat> excuse me, was reputed to be the world's oldest. And Joel, if you could put up slide number one. <clears throat> um, as a trained archeologist, I have long known that the remains of food um, and artifacts associated with cooking like cauldrons, bowls, pots, ladles, commonly appear in <clears throat> um, archeological sites because of course ancient peoples really needed to cook their own food <clears throat> with something. Um, a great archeological site really includes a garbage dump, a midden, a garbage heap. For as you may guess, you can glean quite a bit from going through other people's garbage. <clears throat> other people's trash. But food is also found elsewhere. It's found in tombs. It's uh, placed there as grave offerings for the deceased. Uh, there's uh, models of food. Uh, also because of <clears throat> uh, accidental preservation, um, <clears throat> like these noodles. Um, I'm not seeing the slide. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to interrupt, Bob. But yeah, it looks, guys, it looks like we don't have the, um, the, the slides aren't coming up. Oh, okay. <clears throat> the size aren't coming up. <clears throat> well, okay. Anyway, I can do without them. Um, and uh, we we also know. I'll about... work on it, Bob. I'm sorry. We had a little glitch. I'll work on it right now. Okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> it'll come up again. Um, <clears throat> the Chinese ancient Chinese food is also written about in historical documents, like local histories. It's written about in poetry. Um, there are actually cookbooks, um, ancient cookbooks, and there are even shopping lists that have survived. <clears throat> now, the food of China, much like, uh, like much of its culture, is unique in the length of its endurance and consistency over thousands of years. It's, it's very varied <clears throat> and cosmopolitan. <clears throat> and uh, that being said, it, <clears throat> new foods are constantly being added um, to the kitchen menus over the past millennia, <clears throat> with one rather large exception, and that's dairy products uh, like milk, cheese, and yogurts. But that also is changing in these last few decades. Pepper and spices of all sorts. Bob, can you see the screens? I'm just curious. Sorry, can you see the screens now? Here we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, fruits. Yeah. Okay. So um, fruits and vegetables, especially, have been introduced and has increased the variety of Chinese cuisine, but has not moved it off the stable track of a very, very long tradition guided by ancient cooking techniques. <clears throat> now China's, <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about the size, uh, <clears throat> the geography of China. It's about the size of the United States and it's divided geographically uh, <clears throat> between uh, the Northern part and the Southern part by a range of mountains called the Chilean mountains. <clears throat> And the North has cold winters and hot summers and, um, is, <clears throat> and that's been the way for thousands of years. And it's been an area of wheat and sorghum and millet <clears throat> cultivation. Now the relatively warm and rainy South is what's traditionally called the uh, uh, a, a fertile abundant land of rice and fish. <clears throat> rice, sorghum and soybeans are the main crops there. <clears throat> In prehistoric times, before China was the cultural and historical totality <coughs> that it became two millennia ago, that north-south grain divide also existed, but it was millet in the north as the main grain and rice in the south. 
Now millet is still consumed. It's a very, very nutritious grain, but it's, and it's still consumed in many parts of North China, especially in the hilly rural areas in the form of porridge and breads. But it is today, unfortunately, considered a poor man's fare. <clears throat> um, the world's oldest noodles, which you can see on the screen, I hope, <clears throat> which were just recently discovered and they're over 4,000 years old, are made of millet. <clears throat> Pardon me. The bowl and its contents was preserved accidentally by a landslide under 10 feet of soil. That, yeah. <clears throat> now, while rice is generally associated with Chinese cuisine, wheat holds a strong second place, especially in the North, with wheat-based pasta, such as noodles and dumplings, pan breads and steam breads being very common. Excavations have given us remains of cultivated rice that date 8,000 years ago in a coastal site near Shanghai. Can I have the next slide, please? A site um, <clears throat> called Hamudu, not far from Shanghai. In a <clears throat> site um, right inside the city of Taipei in 1982, I excavated a, uh, um, <clears throat> an ancient village site that where we discovered the remains of cultivated rice that were found. And they were about 5,000 years old. <clears throat> so we know how and that's southern China. Taiwan is considered southern, southern area. So we know how old this cultivation is, how far it goes back. Um, I wanted to skip a number of <laughs> centuries, perhaps a few millennia ahead, uh, to a, a period called the Wei Jin period. That's the third to fourth century AD. And the next slide, please. <clears throat> the well-to-do, the wealthy continued a tradition uh, <clears throat> established by the previ uh, previous age by having their tombs decorated with illustrated bricks, some of which have given us some real insight into daily life. From a tomb near the uh, western end of the Great Wall, it, there's uh, some of these delightful scenes of food preparation, serving, and eating. Now, this is western China. You see uh, they're already using chopsticks, and there is the ubiquitous, uh, which is still ubiquitous in the area, um, shish kebab. <clears throat> also, the uh, on the right you see uh, chopsticks and bowls that date from the second century BC, <clears throat> from Ma Wangdui, and that's in Changsha, in South China. So the chopsticks uh, and the shish kebab have uh, <clears throat> been a tradition for thousands of years in both North and South China. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> The, uh, there's a, a royal cemetery of a Turkic people called the Uyghurs. Uh, we know about the Uyghurs today because they've been in the news a lot uh, in, in, uh, in the desert of the Turfan Basin in Western China, today called Xinjiang, uh, and dates somewhere uh, later to the seventh to ninth centuries AD. How about the next slide, please, Joel? Thank, thank you. <clears throat> um, and this, this uh, royal cemetery has given us a fascinating uh, wealth of foodstuffs and models, including some of the most fascinating. Here we have wheat from um, that was placed in a grave on the left. There are 1300 year old dumplings. And on the right, there are modern dumplings, but basically that uh, <clears throat> tradition has continued to this day in North China. Um, the uh, local craftsmen were in, ingenious at creating charming uh, tomb figures and the accompanying paraphernalia to be buried with the deceased. These uh, delicate pastries are some of the oldest found anywhere, the ones in the middle there. <clears throat> now fruit survived as well. Now an, uh, the next slide, the last slide, please. <clears throat> Joel, thank you. <clears throat> this group of four young women, or, or it could be the same young woman doing four different tasks <clears throat> is making naan bread from scratch as the eighth century AD. Now, what is most fascinating is that this procedure, I have witnessed the same procedure uh, right down to the use of the oven pad in Western China. And uh, <clears throat> so making naan bread. Now, one question I'm sometimes asked is whether Marco Polo brought pasta, especially noodles, ravioli, or pizza to Italy over the Silk Road. Well, I have to respond that 
many different foods found their way back and forth across the great caravan route and many well before Marco Polo stepped upon it. That includes uh, the following foods there's spinach, peaches, pears, ginger, rhubarb, dates, pistachios, walnuts, almonds, coriander, grapes, and sesame. <clears throat> but while the story seems conceivable as both China and Italy share somewhat similar pastas, I'm sorry to say, but it is a myth. An anonymous cookbook appeared in Italy be, uh, between, dated from between 1260 and 1290, a few years before the Polos supposedly made it back from China. And the cookbook men mentions pasta with recipes for vermicelli, tortellini, and um, tortelletti. <clears throat> but the ancient Romans already, and so did their predecessors, the Etruscans, for a pasta shaper was found in an Etruscan tomb. Now there was a recent uh, documentary, uh, <clears throat> a French documentary on the Silk Road, just called The Silk Road, in which the, <clears throat> uh, the host <clears throat> declares that Marco Polo actually did bring pasta to Italy. But <clears throat> I disagree. Uh, the proof is not there. The evidence is not there that he brought pasta to Italy from China. <clears throat> but I'm sure that he shared enough of the pasta while he was both in China as well as home in Italy. <clears throat> now, another thing that's fascinating is, <clears throat> pardon me, the introduction of foreign foods into Chinese cuisine, so-called foreign foods. Today, we take for granted the spiciness of Sichuan and Hunan cuisine and imagine that it's always been like that. <clears throat> but chili peppers were only introduced into Sichuan in the late 19th century. The famous ma la, or the numbing and spicy cuisine, was and is a combination of the native numbing Sichuan pepper, or fagara, and chili pepper from downriver in, in Hunan, <clears throat> which in turn got it from America, <clears throat> the, you know, the uh, Central America, actually. We can also tell from the names of some foods and spices that their origins were from outside China. You know, part of linguistics is the study of how words transmogrify from one language to another, kind of archaeology of language. We know that some foods came from outside of China because their names show from the use of certain prefixes. One prefix is yang, which uh, <coughs> is, means ocean, which means came from overseas. So there's yang yu, which is potato. Literally, it is ocean, <laughs> ocean taro. <coughs> and there's yang tong, which is the Western onion, the onion from overseas. Another prefix is hu, H-U, and it's an ancient Chinese word. It's uh, probably about 2,500 years old, an ancient Chinese term for non-Chinese barbarians from the north, <clears throat> and a prefix in the words hu jiao, or barbarian pepper, black pepper, basically. Hu jiao, hu jiao fun, black pepper powder. Hu jianzi, which is pistachio, <clears throat> and Hulobo carrot. Hulobo is also called Honglobo, uh, barbarian carrot or uh, barbarian turnip or uh, red turnip is the Chinese word for carrot. <clears throat> and another one of these, you might call them pejorative prefixes, is fan, F A N. And it's a word for uh, the southern uh, barbarians from the south, non Chinese from the south. And it often refers to those foods that came in Southern China, uh, often overseas or from Southeast Asia. And <clears throat> one is uh, fan chie, or tomato, and fan shu, which is sweet potato, and fan jiao, which is red chili paper, <clears throat> pepper, sorry. Now, uh, the names of some foods were transcribed. One very ancient borrowing is the Chinese word for honey, which is mi, M-I, mi, and that uh, derives from a very ancient Proto-Indo-European word that's about 4,000 years old, which gave us in the West the word mead, M-E-A-D, which is an alcoholic drink made from honey. So the Chinese mi and our mead in the West are uh, from the same word. A little more recent example is putao, and that's the Chinese word for grape a transliteration of ancient Persian for grape, which is budawa. 
And that the grape came across about 2000 years ago from Central Asia into China. Now, a more modern and interesting example is a Chinese word for beer, <clears throat> which many arguably consider a major food group. Uh, and that word for beer is pijo, <clears throat> um, a word that's uh, the butt of many jokes. While the brew itself is very ancient, um, it was an import into China. In 1903, the Germans set up the first brewery in China in Port Arthur in Shandong, on the Shandong Peninsula. And it's China, the Chinese name of Port Arthur is Qingdao. You may recognize that name, especially those for beer drinkers. The root word P is taken from the German word Pilsner. And Jiu means an, any alcoholic beverage. Then there are the words, more modern words, Bisa is pizza and hambao or hambao bao, which is hamburger. <clears throat> so we do have this back and forth. Now, what about the other direction? <clears throat> other than common foods, uh, common food work, uh, sorry, other than common food words like chow mein or chow fan, Chinese has not made a huge contribution to the language of cuisine in English. <clears throat> there are a few Chinese words that are part and parcel of the English language, like typhoon. Uh, <clears throat> but there is one Chinese word, Chinese food word, that is very common in America that most people have no idea that it came from the Chinese. <clears throat> I'll just think about, give you a, a, a few seconds to think about what is that food word? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> it's ketchup. And ketchup uh, or catsup. Uh, in Mandarin, it's pronounced chiejiang. Uh, chiejiang is accurately, if you translate it directly, it's eggplant sauce. But chie here means tomato, fan chiejiang. Fan chiejiang is tomato sauce. So, uh, <clears throat> but the ketchup is closer to the dialect um, that was spoken in coastal Amoy on the, on the Chinese coast. And of course, the tomato was a valued food plant import from the Americas into China. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so the history of a cuisine traces a, a real fascinating thread of food and cooking through the ages. Um, Archaeology has been able to tie up the threads in a way that literally gives us a taste of what the ancient Chinese, even in prehistoric times, consumed and how they prepared their food. And I hope that uh, tonight uh, I welcome your, your questions and I hope you come away tonight with something to digest from this delicious conversation that we're about to have. Um, so let me turn the mic back to Dee. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. We really appreciate that excellent history. Um, really gives you the, the picture that, that cuisine and culture go hand in hand and in turn go in hand in hand with history which kind of brings me to a, a topic that I think that maybe we can all, uh, or especially Adrian and Bob, can uh, discuss and comment on, and that is Western commodification of Asian cuisine. I mean, you've just described how Chinese cuisine has been so influenced by all these different cultures. Um, you know, uh, Adrian and I could absolutely relate to the fact that uh, Chinese food before the recent wave of immigrants really didn't resemble the traditional Chinese food. And the traditional Chinese food is, um, as I've come to understand, set for wellness. You know, you eat very balanced food. Meat is just a garnish. You eat mostly uh, vegetables and it, it's intentional. And then when you start adding things all together like chop suey, you might as well go eat a, a McDonald's burger. <laughs> it's kind of similar in terms of the nutritional aspect. Any thoughts about that, about how America has changed Chinese food or Asian food? Oh, yeah, that, that's a, this is a, this is a hot topic, to be honest. And sometimes quite often for me, one that is um, quite triggering <laughs> at times. Um, I've got a lot to say about Western commodification and of, of Asian food in the West. And then also what I call often the colonialism of Asian food or sometimes maybe Orientalism, which is basically both of those being 
Asian cultures or Asian food here through the lens of, just to, to put it in an American context, white America. Um, I, my personal, so, so, we, so we obviously know that like this all started with, for example, with um, Chinese food being sold in places like San Francisco Chinatown, for example, um, being sold and created to appease a certain type of customer, which is basically their non-Chinese customers. So they ended up creating certain uh, dishes out of ingredients that they had to work with in order to kind of appease what they thought white people would like. And it turns out that they were right. <laughs> they were right. They liked it. Um, and then, you know, we, I know we're going to talk later about having a second menu or having two menus. But on this note, it, it is very much like they've had this taste profile that they could that they could cater to and they went with it. And I think that, you know, historically that's, we, that has shown us that that is how we have come to this place where we've got what we call Asian, Chinese American food or dare I even say Chinese takeout as a cuisine category itself, which is a, a cuisine and or rather a label that I have a really hard time with because of what it does to the perception of what actual Chinese food is. Um, and I don't wanna get into anything too deep, but you know, my opinion is, is that West, the Western world sees Asian food as something separate. It's a separate category from European food on a hierarchical stamp, from a hierarchical standpoint. You know, in modern food industries, Asian food is a trend that can come and go as and when the industry wants it. Um, and with the further exoticization of Asian cultures, as we have experienced throughout history and the commodification of our cultural markers, as we also have experienced through history, what has evolved is the ori orientalization of Asian food. Asian food, like I said, being presented through the lens of white America, what they perceive Asian food to be or what they think it should be, i.e. Thai so for example, Thai restaurants must be decked out in floor to ceiling rattan walls must look like a, a hut and serve tropical craft talk cocktails. You know, Japanese food must be clean, minimalist, zen, lots of sushi. And Chinese food, we know that generally Chinese people won't touch that stuff because Chinese food in America has been decided as dirty, oily, unhealthy, MSG ridden. There was this one example of a restaurant in New York called Lucky Lee's. Oh. Lucky Lee was started by a Caucasian woman um, selling, as she coined it, healthy, healthy and clean Chinese food without MSG, without all the greasy stuff that you normally get out at your favorite takeout restaurant. Ah, so triggering. But you know, it's, it's these types of things, right? That kind of like erase the cultural markers of our own, of our own cuisines. Um, and, you know, the problem with that is that it sets a precedent. It, it, it sets a stereotype for these cuisines, which are decided by the dominant race. And then when Asian restaurants that are owned by Asian people don't follow those templates, they're seen, the restaurants are then seen as unappealing or unhealthy or just not sustainable enough, or just not within the confines of what the majority industry sees it should be. You know, for example, no, I want more local vegetables. I want more, why can't you have more organic produce? I'm going to go to this Thai restaurant owned by a white guy um, because he sells organic produce, local organic produce. I'm not going to go to that one over there that's, you know, owned by an actual Thai immigrant family that's been here for generations. And, you know, the problem is that the majority of Asians living in America, especially immigrant um, communities, are middle class or on or are below the poverty line. And a lot of people from our community don't have the capital to compete with these white owned restaurants who are selling our food or who have, you know, who have the budgets to source only organic or locally or have trendy shop fits or do swanky branding or marketing. And so those restaurants then fall behind when these other businesses take center stage and then take the credit. It's definitely changing, but it still exists. But when, you, when we speak about how we think how Chinese food has changed over the time, for sure, like, you know, we, our people had to in order to make a buck to sell a product, we had to sell something that was going to be, um, that so. was going to assimilate or appease. But on the other hand, it's now been gotten to the point where it's been taken and completely twisted out of proportion and out of context. And when you, and we all know that when you remove the context of the people and the history, you then there of, of, a, of a food or of a, a cultural market, you then remove the people and the voices of those people from that thing. And that's where it can become very, very, very um, 
very difficult. And I think that's where with this conversation about, you know, what are new generations doing to kind of reclaim, and I think is, is the word, reclaim and decide the direction of Asian food is really kind of, I think really what we're, we're, we're getting at here with this topic. That's just my opinion, but it's a very hot topic for me <laughs> at the moment. Um, if I may um, add to that, it, it was recently brought to my attention when somebody who is of Chinese extraction said, Chinese food in America is not an ethnic food. Chinese, so-called Chinese American food is embraced by everyone, um, but, it's, <clears throat> um, but it's Chinese American food, uh, which has a lot of influence by larger restaurants in big cities like New York or Philadelphia. Um, and there is, a, a, there was, as Adrian mentioned, there's a lot of pressure to cave into the, um, the demands of their clientele. So there's a lot of sugar, there's a lot of sweet and sour, um, there's a lot of uh, 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 grease and oil that normally would not be part of genuine um, <clears throat> Uh, Chinese cuisine. Um, we had mentioned that there are two menus. You go to a, a good Chinese restaurant, there are two menus. There's the ordinary menu for your ordinary um, uh, customer. And then if you are sophisticated enough or you can read Chinese, sometimes it's bilingual, you can order the, you know, from the Chinese menu. And uh, <clears throat> even though it may have some of those Chinese American dishes, it will more often have a more genuine uh, <clears throat> dishes. Um, the other thing that uh, about Chinese American food is that you go to a Chinese restaurant and you have a mishmash of so-called Sichuan food or Hunan, Hunan, Hunanese food, uh, uh, Cantonese food, and it's all thrown together as if it belongs to the same cuisine. But China has, <clears throat> has you, I would say, dozens of different kinds of cuisines. And it's not just the big cities versus the the rural areas it's it it, it varies so greatly uh, from city to city and from region to region um, <clears throat> so it's a uh, it's chinese american food is quite different from what you would get um, now i led tours to china for many many years um, and i would take a group into a, a chinese restaurant for lunch and guess what they would serve us chinese american food because that is what Americans expected Chinese food to be. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> often if uh, a genuine dish was served, they would, uh, Americans might be uh, uh, uncomfortable with the cuisine that's being served. Um, uh, not used to it, not used to the way it looks or the way it smells or, uh, or the texture. <clears throat> the texture is another thing that really uh, uh, Americans have a problem with the texture uh, of Chinese food, like in tofu or, uh, or chicken, uh, chicken breasts, um, that's, that, uh, are <clears throat> that we're just not used to. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention is uh, a popular Chinese, Chinese restaurant chain, uh, PD, uh, P.F. Chang's. <clears throat> P.F. Chang's is really not a Chinese American restaurant chain. Uh, the owners, the, the people who founded the company were not Chinese. Uh, PF is the initials of the American who founded it. And Chang is a, uh, uh, was a, a, a abbreviation of, of, a, of a Chinese name, Chang, C-H-I-A-N-G. Um, and what's really interesting is if you go into a PF Chang and look at the decor, it's very different from a Chinese restaurant. Interestingly, and I mentioned it in my in my uh, in my uh, remarks, is that <clears throat> in ancient China, food was prepared for the dead. <clears throat> One of the problems with going into the other world when you die is if you are not allowed sustenance, not given sustenance, to make that transition from this world to the next world and beyond, then you will become a hungry ghost and you will cause trouble. So every year you would have either on Qingming Festival, um, at the grave of your ancestors, you would make food offerings, or at the um, Hungry Ghost Festival in July, you'd, ma you'd make offerings of food. Um, and so in China, you also have food that's associated with the dead. 
And if you go to a P.F. Chang, all of the artwork <clears throat> is artwork that originally appeared in tombs. And it's, uh, and uh, I remember reading that one uh, uh, person from China didn't want to eat there because it was unlucky. You don't eat in a restaurant that has grave or tomb artwork in it. That's for the dead. Uh, but but with Americans, you go in, uh, you go in, you have these Tang horses, or you have uh, the terracotta warriors. These are all offerings. These are all figures that uh, appear in uh, in tombs in China. So it's unlucky. Um, so uh, anyway, the uh, um, that's my take on Chinese American food. <laughs> so let me turn it back to Adrian. Adrian. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Um, I just want, I was trying to research, I was trying to quickly pull up a, the name of a, a restaurant and a cook um, a, in regards to something I want to talk about, because it's an actual flip side thing, right? So like, you think about like Chinese American food, just as one example, Chinese American food is, is how we in America perceive Chinese food to be. And that is wrong in so many ways. On the flip side, though, you got a lot of Chinese, Amer uh, Asian, excuse me, Asian American kids and let's say just for example's sake, East Asian people who look like me grew up not feeling connected to their heritage, not feeling connected to other people that look like them. There are some people out there who grew up, like looking like me, grew up eating this type of food. And when they go to restaurants and they see Chinese people or East Asian people working the till, working in the, in the kitchen or serving at the tables, there is actually, sometimes there can be this feeling of familiarity and this feeling of belonging, which is something that I talked about before. And here's where I think there is actually some positivity that can come out of this. So there's a restaurant in, sorry, I didn't think I'd be talking about it, um, but there's a restaurant, um, some, I, I'm so sorry to say, I, I can't remember exactly where it is. Is it in the Bay Area called Lazy Susan, which is owned by a, or is uh, chef by a, a chef named Eric Eller who actually is a Korean adoptee. He grew up um, with, a, with a Caucasian parents, but being of a, a Korean ethnicity himself. And so he didn't have any connection to kind of any Asian-ness at all. But when he went with his, with his white family, he would go there to places like this and, and immediately feel like he belongs somewhere. And so what he's done now is he's actually opened this restaurant called Lazy Susan in which he's going to be cooking all of these favorite dishes like General Tso's chicken and sweet and sour pork and you know all of those things and doing it in a way from again from behind the Asian American lens in ways that are uh, that appeal to our taste and speak to our values and what we want in our food and I think that that's where you can actually kind of take this this bad situation and like D like I was saying you know turning it around and really reclaiming these things for yourself another example God, I just did a whole bunch of motions that look like made me look like, like my grandfather. Another example is um, San Francisco Chinatown, for example. San Francisco Chinatown, the architecture there was not actually designed and built by Asian people. It was meant to be a place that was designed by white architects who decided, oh, this is what Asia or China should look like. If we build all of the architecture like this, the Asian people will want to go there and just stay there. And then that's how we can quarter them off during the whole um, exclusion act. When I look at that kind of stuff, I actually grew up thinking, oh, this is what it's like. This is like what Asia is like. This is what, you know, Chinese culture looks like. And now I've gone through the history books and I've learned about it. I know that it's wrong, but I'm trying to find ways in which I can take those things and spin them in a different right, light and reclaim them for something that is mine and reclaim them in a way that is centered around what Asian Americans want to do with those false markers. And I think, so, you know, we have a history in America of, of, of assimilation, systemic racism, and coveting of other cultures to suit the, the, the profit of the dominant race. We've got that, we know that, but we're here now, it's 2021, we have opportunities now to be able to take those false markers and turn them into a, into, turn them into a correct one, into positive ones. And I think that that's really something that I'm seeing a lot happening in, um, in the United States with a lot of younger generation people, and especially with COVID, and I think also with the BLM movement, a lot of BIPOC people, younger generations and people from the Asian American community are really wanting to feel like they belong or feel like they can connect with their roots. And so I'm seeing now this movement and I see it with a lot of my students, a lot of my followers and a lot of my peers 
especially in the food industries, really being like, screw this. I know that in order to be taken seriously as a chef, I had to go to Cordon Bleu. I had to learn how to cook Italian food. I had to learn how to cook European food before anyone should take me seriously. And they did that. Good for them. They put in the work. They're thinking, screw that. I'm going to do what I want to do now. I'm going to cook my heritage food. I'm going to cook this Chinese takeout food and respin it in a way that is appropriate to me and my people. And that's the type of thing that I really, really love to see. You know, it's 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 so wonderful to be able to see young people really taking, you know, all these things, these false markers from our history and turning it into something that is for us. Just went off on one, sorry. <laughs> no, I think that's fabulous. Cause that's one of the things I wanted to, to ask you is, you know, what do you see in contemporary times and how are the younger people approaching um, I've definitely seen a few television spots, like a, a chef in London. Did you see that? Who uh, won one of the only Asian uh, Chinese food Michelin awards? Uh, his father was a immigrant Chinese restaurateur in London, and his father died abruptly, and he took it over, and he just elevated the cuisine. And it's it, it's fantastic to see that kind of courage. Um, but let's take a look at the chat. We've got some very interesting questions. Um, so uh, Walter was asking uh, if there's a few examples of local good food from China. Uh, and I'm thinking local San Francisco or local Louisville. I can tell you Louisville, not so much. Yeah, not so much um, in, the, in the Louisville area. Um, I have had exceptional meals occasionally and actually one of the oldest Chinese restaurants in Louisville, Oriental House, their Chinese menu is, uh, can be outstanding um, and uh, very authentic. Um, however, most, you know, China One, these chains, they, it's basically all Chinese food. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's pretty bad. <clears throat> and then um, you'll notice that, um, well, there's an interesting question. Um, Few Asian restaurants have a strong alcohol segment like the American restaurants. Uh, and why do you think that is? Um, say that again. Um, few Asian restaurants have a strong alcohol segment like American restaurants. And why do you think that is? Is there a cultural reason? Is you know, why do you think that is? Well, you know, I think that there is not that association among Americans. You go to a Chinese restaurant to drink. You can order white wine, usually white wine, not red wine, but it's available. And there are, there are other strong drinks available, but I think the idea is that you don't really go to a Chinese restaurant to drink. Now, if you go to China and you have get together with your friends, you always drink. And it's usually Mao Tai or uh, <clears throat> really strong drinks or, or beer. Uh, beer is actually a very, 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 good um, match for Chinese food, uh, I found over the year. And the Chinese have believed that too, because beer is, is um, basically uh, de rigueur with, with, with Chinese food when you go to a Chinese restaurant, they always have beer. But um, <clears throat> a party or a dinner party in China <clears throat> or in Taiwan, you almost always include alcohol in that. And there's a lot of toasting, not like, <clears throat> You know, it's almost as though I'm daring you to, uh, to drink as much as you possibly can <laughs> to get to get your friends drunk. Um, that's my experience. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> not that I'm trying to get my, my friends drunk, but um, <clears throat> that you do see a lot more drinking in Chinese restaurants in China than you do in Chinese restaurants in the United States. <clears throat> you know, Bob, I think it's so interesting that that has been that you mentioned that because I think there's this kind of like false stereotype that Asian <clears throat> people are like really meek and quiet and want to keep themselves and don't party and that they're just like want to, you know, hide away. I just, I mean, I'm very privileged to have been able to yeah. travel around Asia. Um, but I just got something to say for people who don't really have a lot of exposure to Asian cultures. Asian people like to drink. <laughs> they, I mean, you know, like, like anybody else, but like, you know, I, I grew up, I grew up, I spent like seven years in Japan and their drinking culture there is just, intense people love to drink their alcohol it's not done in the same way though because there's no stigmatism attached to it people while even if they don't drink in even if they do drink in excess there's not kind of this drinking to get drunk just for the sake of getting 
messed up. You know what I mean? It has so much more to do with like toasting, like, like Bob said, toasting to your friends, toasting to your boss, you know, with the salary men culture that they have in Japan. And I know the same, my, my grandfather, my, on my dad's side, this is my Sichuanese grandfather, he would love to sit there with a glass of wine, a glass of whiskey, a little glass of Mao Tai, and a, the bottle of Mao Tai sitting there. And he'd just sit and chat and talk. It's about sitting and sharing stories, talking stories with people. You know, it's not getting drunk for the sake of getting drunk. So it is interesting to think about why we don't have that culture in Asian restaurants here. It is changing. And I think it has changed a lot with the resurgence, or not the resurgence, the kind of the, the fact that things like izakayas have become very trendy, which is essentially izakaya is basically a Japanese pub, a drinking house, which also serves food. It's not really so much about the food so much as it is about the drinking, and they've also got really good food to go with it. Um, that's so that in, in regards, that is changing. But I think on the note of like, and this can kind of actually go into the next question, on the note of like what is considered to be like an authentic experience or an authentic, you know, flavor is really, the authenticity is such a difficult and controversial subject, I think on both sides of the coin. Because on the one hand, as a Chinese American, I want people to know that authentic Chinese food is so much more vibrant and diverse, as Bob has said, and actually extremely sophisticated in its own way because of its deep history. Um, but then also, I don't want people to think that like Chinese food is only the stuff that you will get in China. Because some of us Chinese people, just using Chinese as an example, some of us Chinese people didn't grow up experiencing those traditional dishes. I certainly, because I'm third generation Chinese American, I'm not sure if it's because of my generation, but I certainly did not grow up with traditional dishes in the house. Those dishes that I mentioned before, my grandma's, they were home cooking by a Chinese American woman, a grandma who, you know, when they, she and her family, uh, located themselves to Seattle. They worked with the ingredients that they had from their local supermarkets back in the, you know, the, you know, the, the 1920s and 30s. And you learn to cook culturally appropriately tasting food with the ingredients that exist around you, depending on when it is you're there, right? Depending on the time. And um, so I don't want people to confuse that authentic necessarily means that it's exactly how you're going to get it, for example, in China. And that's what I love about and I keep going back to it. That's what I love about this new wave of Chinese American, or excuse me, I keep saying Chinese, Asian American chefs really taking control of the narrative to create what we think should be considered to be authentic Asian food, at least here from our perspective as Americans. And somebody, David had asked, um, had said, uh, this is terrific. Your comments raise the question of authenticity. Some crave authentic Thai or Japanese or regional Chinese food rather than Americanized versions. Others say that the notion of authenticity freezes a regional or national cuisine in time, noting that a diner's view of authentic Thai, for example, meets Thai food from decades ago. It's like seeking authentic American food, meaning dreadful stuff served in, oh, it's gone. Basically, um, dreadful stuff uh, served in the 1950s. Thai food in Thailand has evolved since then. And while that evolution differs from American Thai food, it isn't the same as the authentic Thai food, which purists desire. So I, what are your thoughts on this topic? And I think authenticity is less about how did they do it in the old days? Authenticity has more to do with lived experience. So the Chinese American food that this Korean adoptee chef that I mentioned before, uh, Eric Eller is doing in his restaurant, I'm sorry to say to some of these white um, restaurateurs, is gonna be a hell of a lot more authentic based on his experience, his personal experience and his personal stories than somebody else doing, you know, some Caucasian guy doing a Thai restaurant. It has so much more to do with just how the food tastes. It's about where it comes from, how you connect with it and allowing the stories of the people who created it and the people who are a part of the community and the descendants of those cuisines, how they tell their stories through that food. And I think that's really important. Um, I noticed a comment that might be of interest um, uh, having to do with, with generations and um, where is it? Oh yeah, is it Hawkers is a multi-unit operator out of Orlando. Um, and it was an exception. Um, they they are second generation Asian operators. Is this key in terms of um, the I guess the alcohol? Uh, I, I mean I I wonder 
I wondered if, I mean, maybe the idea that, that traditionally Asian or Chinese restaurants didn't have much alcohol might have been more about trying to fit in with American culture. I mean, of the day, you know, like there was a lot of anti-drinking culture in American culture. I don't know. Um, okay, that sorry. Very well could, go ahead. That, I was going to say that very well. I mean, that could be it. It could also be because you know how people, you know, Americans, no matter what color you are, you know, when we drink, we get a bit rowdy and loud, right? <laughs> so maybe, maybe these businesses didn't yeah. want there to be crazy rowdiness. Who knows? Yeah, good point. That could be difficult. You know? Do you have you know? any thoughts on, anybody have any thoughts on um, fusion? Um, like, for example, there's a restaurant here in town called um, Dragon King's Daughter. It has really good food, but it's different. They, they serve um, Italian sushi rolls. Um, Etc. Got any thoughts on that? I I, I have, oh sorry, Bob. Go ahead. No, I, I have not eaten there, but uh, one restaurant that is considered fusion, which we we really like, um, is August Moon, <clears throat> and uh, it's it's quite good. <clears throat> but it's but it's uh, fusion, right? Any thoughts on presentation of food? Of that particular restaurant or like with no, um, just, um, in regards to a, fusion? Uh, the question uh, was, I visited China once and the presentation of food to us as a guest was very unique. Can you comment on this? Um, they stack the plates to honor the guests at the table. And um... it was all oh, very unique, I see. Mm -hmm. I think the way in China and specifically, but in many Asian cultures across the continent, Asian cultures tend to be very deferential and they tend to be very humble. They will always put the customer first and they will always do their best to appease the customer. That's just what it is. Like you are there, they are there to serve you. And so oftentimes they'll, they'll especially if a person is not of Chinese origin and they go to a Chinese restaurant in China, they will probably pull out all the stops to really put on a good show, which, you know, mm -hmm. That, that's cool. But then also there is a lot of, you know, def, you know, deferring in the way that we present food to people as well. Um, like I said, because you're serving people. Um, so that, that may have something to do with it. I think because a lot of Chinese, just specifically here, Chinese American food, as we see it here is very um, casual feeling as I think that that has a lot to do with just the general history of Chinese food as being very kind of cafe diner style kind of stuff. And I think when that's what we get when we're in America and we have this kind of preconceived uh, image of what Chinese food should be, uh, how it should be presented, good or bad, it is definitely going to be different where you come from. So I think it just, it, it depends on where you go. I think it depends on what kind of food you're having, you know, what level of stars the restaurant has and how much they want to please their foreign customers. Mm -hmm. you know, which is valid, totally valid. Yeah, I was um, in one, Asia for a short time um, when I was younger, like in the 80s and 90s, and, and with the huge wealth disparity, what, what a discrepancy, what I did notice was that the wealthy live beyond, you know, like crazy rich Asians, like that movie, you, you've got that level of elaborateness and fanciness, mm -hmm. and then you've got homey food, um, yeah. and they're just presented very differently, obviously. Well, it's like, like it's else. like, yeah, it, 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 exactly. Just like anywhere else. And it's, it's, you know, in the West, we're so used to, in America, we're so used to like, you know, America's so insular in so many ways. We know that where there's other countries in the world, but we do get stuck in our bubble, right? And stuck in our ways of thinking how things should be or could be. And um, people tend to forget that Asian, Asia, <laughs> number one, is a culture made up of, I mean, we all know this, but people do tend to forget subliminally that Asia is a huge continent with mm -hmm. loads of different cultures who have a history, almost kind of unrecorded history or uh, un, a history that we can't decipher of so many other cross-cultural migrations and sharing and trading um, that, you know, you, it, that's hard for us to keep track of. So it's, it's hard to know exactly what you are going to authentically experience or what you're going to get out of any kind of Asian cuisine because there's so much diversity and so much evolution of these cuisines that that are going to make it unrecognizable to us here in the states. Mm -hmm. uh, to <clears throat> respond to the question is food in China changing given the increasing affluence? Uh, my experience is that it has because uh, the China is the younger and younger people are becoming more and more affluent and with that mm -hmm. is uh, while there is a movement, say, there is a movement afoot 
to ban shark fin soup uh, among young people. But once you um, have a very affluent uh, population, the uh, extravagance of Chinese meals really goes through the goes through the roof. It's just amazing. And every exotic, every possible exotic dish, you know, whether it's, you know, a bird's nest soup or shark fin soup or um, <clears throat> turtle, um, um, uh, th these all show up on the menu. And uh, uh, so it's, uh, I think that, you know, it's hard to say that I don't think China's cuisine has really changed because of the affluence. I think that, however, there are more Western restaurants influencing, uh, being introduced into China that is influencing um, uh, the taste there. I mean, uh, uh, young people just love to go to uh, Pizza Hut <clears throat> or to uh, 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 Case, uh, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> um, these are all very, very popular, uh, and not just for food. I mean, uh, um, uh, also uh, in terms of uh, Starbucks. Starbucks is extremely popular as well. Um, so I, I do think that the affluence uh, that we see in China today has has encouraged the strengthening of traditional Chinese cuisine. But then there, as I pointed out, there are always new things coming in to the environment that are being accepted as influencing the local cuisine. <clears throat> I think it's also really important to mention or to, to remember that China has a, his, a very, very long history of being one of the most advanced technologically and intellectual, not, not intellectually, uh, technologically and like philosoph philosophically and, you know, et cetera, et cetera one of the most in the, in the world for tens and of thousands of years. So I think this, this perception that like, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, affluency is kind of really not the, uh, the best way to look at it because in terms of the food, like I said, we've got this really deep, um, sophisticated cuisine, which has been at times at the highest levels centered around extravagant banquets, like Bob said, you know, extravagant ingredients, exotic ingredients. So in fact, this kind of like showmanship of cuisine and, you know, doing things like to the nth degree is a part of Chinese food, which has always been there. And I think even after the cultural revolution, and we lost all of those historical markers, a lot of those things do kind of remain. So I think that in terms of like how Chinese food has seemingly um, changed or possibly evolved or seemed to become more like haute cuisine status, I think that that's more a matter of just doing what they've always done to be honest. And it just never having been seen, never been seen before by the Western world. I mean, I, I, I can even say like from the 1980s growing up then, and I would go to, you know, banquets with my my mom and my grandparents for Chinese New Year, et cetera. Some of these banquets were just insane, the amount of food they bring you, the plateware and the crockery and the serving, the amount of ingredients that I've got a problem with as well, because I'm an animal rights ad activist, et cetera, et cetera. All these really over the top things that like, you know, are, I think the average person wouldn't expect. And I think, um, you know, when we look forward at like thinking about how Asian food has changed, I think we think more about like how people's mindsets change about how they look at their own culture. And I think, yeah, I think to a degree, like, especially you get it in Japan as well. And I can say, cause I, I lived there for a long time is that Asian culture sees the benefit of borrowing markers from Western world, but it's a global, it's a globalized world we live in, right? And so they, they use those things in their culture to, to benefit them when, when they can and on their terms. Um, but I think for me, it's, it's more thinking about like how the people themselves have, have, have changed and how uh, the cuisine follows that mindset, if that makes sense. I hope that did.
there was a question about um, whether the cuisine um, evolved in America because of um, the greater availability of meat. Um, and I, I would say, I mean, in, in Chinese tradition, meat is a garnish, it's not a main dish. Absolutely. When you, and also, because when you think about like, you know, the, at the root of all ethnic food, or it's ethnic, at the root of all cuisines, it all started with what we all ate when we were all tribal people, right? It all started there. And so what we had when we were tribal people in places like Asia, you start with what is available and you're, you're eating and you're living to survive. So like Dee said, it's like you're, you're, what you have available is what you've got. So eating meat for the average person who's not a royal, um, yeah, food, uh, meat for sure is absolutely um, kind of like a treat. It's a thing that you have on the side. And it's also something that's tied a lot to Buddhism, religious ideology, philosophical ideology, how that fits into food and how, how it's changed the way we look at the food as well. Um, I know there's different sects of Korean food, which are heavily influenced by their temple food, different parts of Korean food that is heavily influenced by their street food, parts that are influenced by China, parts by Japan and parts by India. So it's just so many ways in which, you know, cuisine can manifest and yeah, again, in these very, very different ways. That's a, it's, uh, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I'm done. <laughs> That's a very interesting question because I remember when I first, um, first went to uh, Taiwan, um, as a student, I lived with a Chinese family and dinner would be maybe one meat dish <clears throat> and four or five vegetable dishes. Uh, I lived in Taiwan for over 10 years and the island was becoming more and more prosperous. So I would go to a friend's house or, or go to a, a, a close friend's house. It would be eight or 10 dishes for dinner and almost all of them would have meat in them. So they had gone from a lack of basically poverty to prosperity. And that was reflected in the diet in um, um, consuming more meat. Uh, there are certain meats that were not really popular like beef because um, um, I just anyway uh, beef was not popular it is now <clears throat> um, but chicken and fish and uh, and other meats were very very popular so um, it did o over the the years that I was in Taiwan and it was 1976 to 1989 uh, off and on for almost 10 years the diet changed very very drastically uh, much more meat. <clears throat> I just started to type a comment to one of the questions, which was, you know, could the Midwest support a, um, a high quality um, Asian restaurant, you know, um, you know, mentioning Columbus, Ohio, which, which I, I was going to comment is a very culturally diverse town. And it has wonderful food, but I, I, I don't think it could really support a really high-end um, Asian restaurant. Um, you know, in some of the bigger cities like New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, you find some very, very high-end Asian restaurants. Um, and the cuisine is really exquisite. But I, I have to confess that whenever I've eaten there, I kind of miss the homey, folky, normal kind. <laughs> I can relate to that so much. And, 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 and I, I want to quickly say that much of my experience is based on having the privilege of living so close to San Francisco, where the food is so diverse. And there's such a huge population of talented Asian chefs doing the work to reclaim our, our culture. So I've got to, I have to uh, confess that that, that that is for sure my perspective. Um, but you're right. Sometimes when things get taken a bit too far, you start to lose too far, what does that mean? But you know, when it gets a bit too elevated, it starts to lose the hominess that I think a lot of us Asian Americans really crave when we eat the food from our home continent or from, you know, from our ancestors. So I think that that's a really interesting point to make because on the one hand, you want businesses to, to grow and to be, to even the playing field to a degree, but then on the other hand, sometimes you lose a bit of that, um, that, that familial connection, I suppose you could say, but I guess that could be the heritage cooking that you've always yeah no for sure I agree that the home heritage cooking right mm -hmm. the folk cooking mm -hmm. um one thing that uh Josephine May said was um it's not a it's a, not a question but a comment 
um, it has been difficult to have Westerners pay a higher price for Chinese food, whereas they are willing to pay a premium for French food, another demonstration of bias discrimination, even though there is highly evolved Chinese cuisine. And I am so grateful that you mentioned that. Um, and I think it's true. And I think it speaks very much to this preconceived notion that Chinese food should be cheap because it is cheap, because the ingredients are cheap and because it's not considered to be a, uh, a an official cuisine, you know? And I, so I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned that. But again, for those of um, you who are not near cities where, you know, we've got this plethora of incredible Asian chefs, don't worry, the work is being done, <laughs> you know? And I think, and I would have to say that on this note of, because I know we've got to go soon, on this note of unearthing your roots, I really, really, really encourage all the Asian American API people here, and even the non, to really get on social media, get on Google, and look for Asian American and Asian chefs who are doing this work of evolving our cuisines. Really search around. There's so, and this is the beautiful thing about social media and, um, and the internet, which has really helped me kind of grow my community, is that we've had the opportunity to see what people are doing. Um, and, 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 and they can, and there's ways and books and resources which can teach you, like mine, <laughs> my classes, um, which can teach you to do these authentic traditions because they come from a place of personal experience and personal stories. Adrian, thank you so much um, for your comments. And Dee and Bob, I really do want to thank you all so much for your comments. This conversation can go on for uh, much longer. I'm actually surprised with the uh, the amount of questions we had. I just wish we had more time to answer all those questions. So with that being said, I do want to thank Adrian, Bob, and Dee so much for your insightfulness and your participation in this conversation. But before I let you go, um, first of all, I'm glad that we're all together. I, I miss hanging out and conversing with everyone during these pandemic times. But before we go, I'd like to see if Bob can just give us a brief insight into his next virtual conversation, which is taking place on April 22nd. Hopefully, hopefully you will join us um, about the Silk Road Saga. So if you could just give us a brief commercial, Bob, about what we will be looking forward to listening sure. to. Um, well, uh, I'm going to give a talk on uh, on the Silk Road. Um, I, as a, uh, in the travel business, um, for over 20 years, I specialize in the Silk Road. So I've been to almost all of the um, let's see what happened here. Hello? Yes, you're there, Bob. You're still there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I'd been on the Silk Road about 35 times, 30 to 5 to 40 times. Um, so what I'm going to talk about are the various peoples, the archaeology, of course, the sites that we see along this ancient uh, uh, route of communication between China and the West and India. Um, and also <clears throat> in my uh, explorations, you might say, um, there was something that basically popped up in front of me while I was on one of my trips, and that was the discovery of, of mummies in Western China, so-called Xinjiang mummies. So I will not only introduce the, uh, <clears throat> the Silk Road itself, coming from the, China, uh, from the Chinese perspective, I will talk about uh, the discovery and the importance of the uh, remains of these people that lived four to uh, 3,000 years ago in the area. So, <clears throat> so I hope you can join me. Well, we look forward to it, Bob. Thank a you April so 22nd. much. April 22nd, we haven't set the time yet, I don't think. Okay, yeah, so yeah. 22nd, and we'll, we'll, we'll inform everyone on the time. Before we go, also, just a couple of things. Um, again, Asia Institute Crane House is a 501c3 nonprofit, <laughs> and we really, we really thrive on the support from supporters like you. I just posted on our chat uh, the link on how to donate to Crane House easily, www.cranehouse.org slash donate. Um, and on a final note, uh, because of the uh, recent uptick of violence, Crane House has been talking with our government partners as well as our community partners. And we also do plan to schedule a, um, a virtual conversation on hashtag stop Asian hate. We, uh, first of all, I have to say, I'm very, 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 uh, very happy with the Louisville community. We have received a lot of unsolicited support and an unsolicited um, 
uh, request for, for such a conversation. So once we get the final details on that, I hope you can join us for that conversation, hashtag Stop Asian Hate. Thank you all so much for joining us. It was my pleasure to host this, host this. Adrian, thank you so much for joining us considering the time difference in uh, California. Um, and again, I, my, I guess my next, my, my next duty is to grow thank my you, hair as beautiful as yours. It's gorgeous. So thank, thank you, you all. Look forward to engaging with you in our, our next few conversations and everyone have a great evening. Thank you so much. And Dee, thank you so much for facilitating. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye now. Good night, thank you. Good night.